Yeah, is this working? Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, so today uh, we'll uh, describe uh, equivariant algorithms. Maybe I uh, should start with equivariant uh, cohomology. Um, which is related to the cohomology of classifying spaces. Um, okay, so in topology, the setup is you take a, a topological group, um, for example, a discrete group uh, acting on a topological space, um, x, let's say, and um, you choose a contractible space with a free action of g, which essentially always exists. Um, let's call that eg contractible free G space, um, then um, equivariant cohomology, or Borel equivariant cohomology is, uh, I mean, there's different versions of equivariant cohomology. Um, this version uh, is as follows. Um, so you just define H I sub G of X, maybe with integer coefficients or whatever, to mean, um, you take the cohomology of x times this contractible space um, modulo the action of g. Okay. Um, so, you know, in other words, equivariant cohomology just is the cohomology of uh, an associated space. Oh, yeah, and, and we, the thing to realize about this space is that, so g is acting both on x and on eg, sort of acting diagonally, uh, but the action is free because we know the action is free on eg, uh, even no matter how it's acting on x. <laughs> So, you know, so this is the quotient by free G action. Um, yeah, so in particular, because equivariant cohomology is the cohomology of some space, for example, it is a ring because the cohomology of any space is a ring. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, and I, I guess the basic thing to say is that this is um, independent of the choice of uh, EG. So that doesn't matter. Um, you know, given G. So, uh, and then some quick examples. Oh, well, number one, the equivariant cohomology of a point is just um, what I called earlier the cohomology of BG. Um, right, which is obvious, hopefully, because uh, BG, the classifying space, was defined as a, I mean, then this is just EG mod G, which is what I called the classifying space. Um, but secondly, if the group is acting freely um, um, on X, which is sort of the opposite from this case number one, uh, freely on x, then equivariant cohomology is just the cohomology of the quotient space. Um, so, you know, in short, what this construction does, uh, called the Borel construction, is that you, you modify uh, x to get something, this is, of course, this is homotopy equivalent to x, right? But now you, you've modified it in such a way that g acts freely on that. Um, and somehow, if, G was already acting freely, and you don't have to do any, this modification doesn't make any difference. <coughs> okay, um, right. And so, you know, what's the point? I mean, maybe just, so, so quick formal property would be that anytime you have a map of G spaces, you have a pullback homomorphism uh, on equivariant uh, child rings, or, or, or cohomology rings. Um, where, of course, yeah, I hope it's good, but a G map means uh, uh, if G acts on two spaces, and um, uh, you have a continuous map from x to y, then the f is g equivariant or, or a g map um, if, uh, you know, f of g times x equals uh, g of f of x. So the map is compatible with the actions of g on the two spaces. Um, okay, uh, right. So, you know, I might say, what is the point of equivariant cohomology? I mean, one way to justify it would be that sometimes you're interested in co computing the cohomology of uh, quotient spaces by, for example, free group actions, um, but equivariant cohomology puts that in a broader context. So if you can relate your space to your G space to some other G spaces where the group is maybe not acting freely, um, then you'll have exact sequences that relate the cohomology that you might be interested in with uh, the equivariant cohomology of other spaces. Now it might seem that you're making things more complicated by allowing spaces where the action is not free, but the point is it just makes things more flexible. Uh, and in some cases that might be actually a good way to compute things like this. <laughs> okay, uh, oh yeah, and so maybe like, yeah, you should have a picture in mind for what this space is like. Um, so the point is that there's a natural vibration 
um, from this uh, Borel construction space, or I mean, actually another terminology for this would be the homotopy quotient of x mod g. So um, x times e g mod g, this double slash uh, standing for homotopy quotient. Well, there's an obvious projection where you map to, um, if you just forget about the x factor, then this maps to e g mod g, which is b g, um, and, right, because it's e g mod g, and the fiber of that map, hopefully it's obvious, is x. Okay, so, um, so a covariant cohomology is the cohomology of, you know, of this space, um, which is a bundle, of, you know, it's sort of x bundle over b g. And so, for example, um, you get a spectral sequence for computing uh, the cohomology of, uh, of, of yeah, uh, equivariant cohomology in terms of the cohomology of BG and of X, right? Um, okay. Right. All right. So um, now I just, you, you can sort of immediately imitate this story in uh, algebraic geometry, given what we said. So equivariant shell groups um, following uh, Edithen and Graham. And yes, maybe to be lazy, I will just define this in the case of um, a smooth space, smooth variety with a G action. Um, okay, so let's say X is a, this is, yeah, just being lazy really, so I have rings to work with instead of just groups. Um, so we'll say I have a smooth case scheme um, with an action of um, an affine group scheme G, find a type over K. Um, okay. All right, then in this situation, you can define um, the equivariant chow groups of uh, X with respect to the G action by um, chow over I sub G of X means uh, just the same thing as here, um, only I'll, I'll state it using only you know, finite dimensional approximations uh, to BG. Namely, you take X times, say, V minus S. Uh, right, sorry, chow groups. Chow upper I of um, X times an open subset of a representation divided by G, where, um, uh, oh, right, <laughs> I'm supposed to leave more space on the board, so I'll try. Uh, where, uh, yeah, V is a finite dimensional representation of G over K and uh, S inside V, same thing as I said before, uh, is a closed uh, algebraic G invariant subset of V um, such that, well, you know, V minus S mod G is some kind of approximation to BG, but I need it to be a good enough approximation, meaning that the co-dimension of S uh, should be big. So co-dimension of S of V is greater than this number I that we're given. <coughs> so, so to define a given uh, equivariant child group, you have to find a representation where the group acts, you know, freely enough in that sense. <coughs> okay, uh, right, and you know, you have the immediate analogs of those two properties, and you can write it down, right, so the equivariant child ring of a point is by definition the child ring of BG, and um, if you have a group that's acting freely on some uh, variety, then uh, the equivariant chow ring is the chow ring of the quotient. So in that case, you know, why is that? Um, I guess uh, what I want to do, yeah, yeah, so, so maybe I should, yeah, check that. So, um, so if G acts freely on some smooth variety X, then um, equivariant chow ring of X is the same thing as the equivariant, sorry, uh, it's just the chow ring of the quotient because um, I can think of this, in that case, I can think of this thing that we're uh, talking about. I could sort of, uh, I have a vibration sort of running the other way. Instead of uh, dropping the X factor like I did there, I could drop the V minus S factor. Um, since we have a sort of vibration, vibration doesn't have a very precise sense in algebraic geometry, but nonetheless, there's a map from say, X minus V minus S mod G to x minus g, mod g, and, and what's the fiber of that map? Um, the fiber is just an open subset of a vector space. Um, and yeah, and so, uh, yeah, so the child groups in co-dimension i of this are just, well, so yeah, 
If we just had a vector bundle over x mod g, then the chow ring of this would be the same as the chow ring of that. Here we have a vector bundle minus some small uh, subset, but that small subset, you know, because it's high codimension, it doesn't mess up, this doesn't change this codimension i chow group. Um, and so chow i of yeah, this quotient is just um, the chow ring of this, which is equivariant uh, chow groups. Okay. So it's, it's basically using homotopy invariants uh, for chow groups. Okay. Uh, right. So, mm. Okay, yeah. Uh, so now in general, I guess maybe, yeah, this kind of vibration, in some sense, we still have this uh, in, in algebraic geometry. Um, just thinking of, I mean, just think of BG as, this, as the co-limit of these finite dimensional approximations. You know, what are we talking about with equivariant child groups? We're talking about the child groups of a bundle over BG um, where the fibers are X, you know? So not necessarily a product, but some kind of twisted product like that. So, so now, the difficulty is that in algebraic geometry, there's no analog of this spectral sequence for child groups. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of unfortunate. It's part of the difficulty is that this, this bundle, this sort of X bundle over BG is not gonna be, typically not gonna be locally trivial in, in the Zariski topology. Um, and we don't, somehow child groups only behave well with respect to the Zariski topology, not the Atal topology or something. So, yeah, so there, <laughs> There's not a, a simple relation between the equivariant child groups and the child ring of BG. Um, you don't have something like this. But nonetheless, I, what I want to argue is that it's, sort of, it's good to have this picture in mind when you're thinking about what equivariant child groups are. <coughs> okay, let's see. At least, I guess, you know, one thing this does make clear is that you have a ring homomorphism from the child ring of BG to um, equivariant child groups. Uh, so you can think of ch equivariant child groups are always a module over the child ring of BG. <coughs> Okay, all right. So yeah, to do some, I wanna like uh, go over a problem in the, um, in the last problem sheet. Uh, and yes, for that, I want to maybe again, do some topology as an analogy. Um, right, so I'll talk about the Gaysen homomorphism uh, in topology. There's a lot of versions of this. Gaysen homomorphisms in general in topology mean sort of wrong way homomorphisms. So for example, for any continuous map, you have a pullback map on cohomology, um, but for nice maps, you also have a push-forward map on cohomology, and anything like that would be called a, a Giesen homomorphism. <coughs> um, okay, so let's consider the following setup. So let's say that Y um, is a real manifold, um, X inside Y is a closed submanifold, um, closed meaning that it's a closed subset, it might not be compact, excuse me. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, and for what I want to say, so, and suppose that um, uh, we're given an orientation on the normal bundle um, of X and Y. Um, so the typical way this would come up is that if you're given orientations on both X and Y, then that gives you, in a, you know, you have to choose some convention, but that determines an orientation on this um, normal bundle. So given that, um, you can define a uh, push forward or Giesen homomorphism, um, so just kind of various names for the same thing. Um, so if this is inclusion is called F from X to Y, um, sorry, <laughs> this picture, right? X and Y, um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, F lower star goes from the cohomology of X to the cohomology of uh, Y, but with a shift in degree, um, where R is the codimension of X and Y. <coughs> Okay, um, right, and uh, yeah, and you should always like, <laughs> under, this has a simple geometric meaning. Why is there the shift in degree? Well, not every cohomology class, but one good way to think about <laughs> an example of a cohomology class um, is to think of an element of I, H upper I of X. It might be represented by codimension I submanifold of X, you know, so, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, and so <laughs> what are we doing? Well, if you're given a codimension I submanifold of X, you can just view it as a, as a submanifold of Y, but now it has a larger codimension. Yipes. <laughs> um, right, codimension I plus R. Okay, uh, so that, that's the geometric meaning. I hope it's clear, but um, it's also easy to define this uh, formally. Um, you can just use um, basically the total isomorphism theorem. Use, you, you have a map of pairs of spaces 
um, from y comma the empty set to y comma e uh, what I want to say y comma y minus x. So you get a pullback map on cohomology associated to this map of pairs. Um, so let's say h i. Uh, how should I write this? Yeah, maybe h i plus r perhaps of um, y comma y minus x has a restriction map or a pullback map to h i plus r of y. But what is this space? Um, you know, if you take y and you imagine identifying to a point everything outside of x, that's the same thing as if you, you know, did that construction just for a little tubular neighborhood of x, and that is the tone space of the normal bundle, right? Take the total space of the vector bundle relative to uh, the, the complement of the zero section. You know, or you might like to say, take a little disk bundle, take a disk bundle and consider that relative to the sphere bundle on the boundary. It's the same thing. So, so this is the same thing as hi plus r of the tome space over x of this normal bundle. <coughs> Um, this you might call kind of, kind of excision isomorphism, um, but then by the tome isomorphism, that's the same thing as just hi of x. Um, by tome isomorphism, right, that the tome isomorphism theorem says that given an orientation on a vector bundle, uh, the, the cohomology of the tome space is just the cohomology of the base space with a shift uh, by the dimension of the bundle. Um, so using the orientation. Okay. Right, so what to do with that? Um, let's see. Okay. okay, so then I can you know make the analogy of that with sort of the same. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Say one more thing about that. So um, you could. Uh, yeah, a nice question then is to ask what happens if I take a cohomology class on X, push it forward to Y, and then pull it back. Um, and yes, not really trying to prove anything, but um, so for cohomology class in X, if you, um, in that situation, if you mm, push it forward to a cohomology class on Y and then pull it back to X, what do you get? Um, well, you can't just get X again because now you're, you've shifted the degree by R. Um, you, so you map from HI of X to HI plus R of X. What is that? The answer is it's multiplication by the Euler class. Uh, of the uh, normal bundle. So this is the Euler class of an oriented real vector bundle. You need the orientation for this also, which lives in HR of uh, X. Okay. Um, right. And yes, I don't want to <laughs> spend a lot of time on this, but the point is, uh, again, this should be geometrically clear if you understand what the Euler class means. The Euler class means you, you take a, a section of your vector bundle and look at the zero set of that. The order class of a vector bundle is um, the, 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 cl the class of the zero set of a general section. Um, oh yeah, so, so by the way, I'm imagining, yeah, I just look at a little tubular neighborhood, so y is just the total space of the normal bundle. So, you know, um, why is this? Just, just <laughs> try to think about it. Let, let's say, for example, we take u to be one in um, h zero of x, which represents sort of the class of all of x. Um, so what we're doing is take the class of x, push it forward. So you're thinking of x as a cohomology class in y. It's an r degree cohomology class on y because x has co-dimension one, and then restrict that to x, which means intersect that submanifold with x. But if you just naively intersect x with itself, it has the wrong dimension. You're supposed to get a co-dimension r submanifold of x. So to get the right answer, you have to perturb x a little, uh, and then you know. Then when you intersect it with x, pull it back to x, you get the zero set of a general section, and that's the order class. <clears throat> okay, All right. Uh, any questions? I'm being vague, but uh, you can still interrupt. Uh, yeah, okay, so, okay, and then I'll just say that, you know, the same story works in other rate geometry. Um, so, in child groups, um, so if you're given, uh, let x inside y be, um, a closed embedding of smooth uh, K-schemes, um, then K-schemes then, okay, so in this situation, let's say F from X to Y is the inclusion again, then again, um, we can, we have a pullback homomorphism on child groups. Ah, I <laughs> didn't really say that, did I? Um, let's see, so, okay, we, per, we have a push-forward homomorphism um, on child groups 
which shifts the uh, co-dimension. Mm, right, because I'm writing things in terms of uh, co-dimension. A co-dimension I subspace of X becomes co-dimension I plus R in Y. Uh, and uh, as a, a, one of many things I didn't say already, um, and we have a pullback homomorphism on child groups. Um, uh, we have this actually for any morphism of, of smooth schemes whatsoever. Um, chow I of Y to chow I of X. Actually, we can do that for any um, morphism of smooth uh, K schemes. So defining this is, uh, you know, not easy in general. It's, it's essentially the same problem as, um, as defining the intersection product on child groups. Um, but yes, one has this construction. So basically, like in good situations, so, so if an element here is represented by, you know, sub variety, um, which sort of meets uh, x transversely, then this is just given by intersection of that sub variety with uh, y. So in general, you have to do something like perhaps given an element here, it might be represented by some sub variety that doesn't meet x nicely, then you might want to say, argue that it's equivalent to some cycle that does meet x nicely, and then do the intersection. Then you have to show that that's well defined, uh, and so on. <coughs> okay. Uh, right. But anyway, so what I wanted to say is that given those two maps, um, you have the same formula, or the corresponding formula for child groups. Mm. So then it's like a fact, proposition, or something that for any element in this situation, a closed embedding of smooth K schemes for any element in the child groups of X, if you um, push it forward to y and then pull it back, what you get is uh, u times, well, I want to say the Euler class of the norm bundle. Um, in this situation, that's the same thing as the top uh, churn class of the norm bundle. Um, so for cop, I could have said this in, in topology um, also. Uh, for, for, so here we're talking about real vector bundles, but if you happen to have a complex vector bundle and view it as a real vector bundle, then the Euler class of that real bundle is exactly the top uh, churn class of the complex vector bundle. Here, here we sort of just have churn classes, but this, this one uh, acts like an Euler class. <laughs> OK. Right. And so um, for example, oh yeah, I mean, and the sort of geometric intuition should be the same, right? I mean, if you could sort of perturb y, uh, sorry, if, if you like had uh, a section of, of, of that bundle that um, you know, that <laughs> was sort of transverse to the zero section, then, you know, the same geometric picture should prove that formula. In general, in algebraic geometry, this bundle might not have sections, but nonetheless, you know, with some work, you still prove the same formula. <laughs> okay, uh, what's it say? So, okay. Oh, yeah, so for example, uh, yeah, a computation that you can get from this would be, um, what can I say about the total space of the vector bundle minus the zero section? So for any vector bundle, uh, e on a smooth k scheme x. Um, again, I might, algebraic geometers like to think of e as a sheaf, but I could also think of it just as, as a scheme. Um, sort of might be called the total space of e. That's a scheme with a morphism to x. Uh, inside e is the zero section, which is um, isomorphic to x. And so uh, a reasonable computation question is, is what are the child groups of E minus the zero section? If the child groups of all of E would just be isomorphic to the child ring of X, but um, the child ring of E minus the zero section is, um, mm, is what would you expect? Uh, the child ring of the base space X minus, uh, sorry, modulo the ideal generated by the top uh, churn class uh, of E, where R is the rank of this one. Okay, and uh, yeah, so maybe I won't write anything down, but the point is just to pr use the uh, localization sequence of proof and quotes, use the localization sequence plus this calculation uh, up here. I guess this formula might be called the, the self-intersection um, formula. QED in quotes. Um, okay, but anyway, you know, I hope it's clear basically like, so the, the, that localization sequence, at least it tells you that the chow ring of E, which is isomorphic to the chow ring of X, maps onto the chow ring of this uh, open subset of E, 
Um, so it's definitely some quotient of the child ring of x. And yeah, if you look at the, the map, um, you see that we're exactly mudding up by this. OK. Right. OK, so I wanted to yeah, do an example from the mm, last problem sheet this way. Mm. Okay, so let's say, uh, so let G be the multiplicative group over a field. I guess it doesn't matter which one. Um, and let this act on uh, the affine plane over k by you know, t of x comma y equals t x comma t inverse y. You could modify this problem to put any powers of t you want in there. Um, then uh, the problem is, let's say, to compute the equivariant Chow ring of this uh, open set. Right, so here's uh, A2. <laughs> this is some. Um, GM action where the orbits, if you think about what they look, the orbits look like uh, hyperbolas typically, like so, um, except there's sort of a special case that um, there's one orbit which is sort of the x-axis minus the origin, another orbit is the y-axis minus the origin, and then the origin itself would be an orbit, although we're uh, throwing that out. <coughs> okay, so let's say the answer, I, I, yeah, I would argue that the right way to do this problem, the nice way, is to um, well, okay, first let me sort of contemplate what this means in geometric terms. So, uh, yeah, in geometric terms, we're talking about the Chow ring of <laughs> some space. What, what is that space? Um, so the homotopy quotient of A2 minus 0 by GM, um, you know, it maps to BGM, as I said, which you could sort of think of as P infinity, and the fiber is A2 minus 0, okay? So, um, so that's that's the kind of uh, space that we're we're talking about here. You know, you could say this all in terms of finite dimensional approximations, but I hope this is just as clear. Um, so basically, what we're talking about the Chow ring of some a two minus zero bundle over uh, projective space. So it's a rank two bundle over projective space minus the zero section, which is why uh, all this stuff was relevant. Okay. So um, now we have a localization sequence for um, equivariant child groups just as for normal uh, child groups. Uh, by the way, uh, <laughs> how much time do I have? OK, OK, thanks. Um, we have a localization sequence for equivariant child groups, so let me just write it out and then discuss. So like G, you know, uh, yeah, I'll just write it out <laughs> in this case, right? So we could talk about the geoequivariant child ring of just the origin that maps into the G-equivariant Chow ring uh, of um, the affine plane. But there's a shift in degree, right? Because a, a co-dimension I uh, subspace of the space here is, has co-dimension I plus 2 in the space we're talking about here. Uh, and then there's Chow uh, for I plus 2, GM of A2 minus the origin, and that's on 2. Okay. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, OK. I mean. And I'm just sort of telling you that we have this localization sequence in equivariant child groups as in usual child groups. But the point is, um, that's obvious, because equivariant child groups are, <laughs> by definition, the child groups of some actual you know, finite dimensional varieties. Like this, this group is um, the child group of a certain finite dimensional approximation to this. And you know, this is the, the child groups of a certain closed codimension to a submanifold of that. And so, so this just is the usual localization sequence applied to our um, approximations. OK. All right. uh, yeah. OK, and then you have to understand what those, uh, what those groups are. Well, hopefully, the, the first one is clear. This is the geocovariant, GM equivariant Chow ring of a point, which is just um, the Chow ring of um, BGM, in this case. Um, and you know, we know that. So the, the Chow ring of BGM is um, the polymer ring on one generator in degree one, um, um, let's see, maybe this, yeah. So, OK, so we know these groups. Um, and yeah, maybe I will add the point that there, you, know, you can sort of give this generator a, a good name, OK? So uh, yeah, I should make this general point that for any um, representation v of an algebraic group uh, g, we can view v as a vector bundle on vg, or v determines 
a vector bundle um, on VG. Um, OK, so I mean, this is a familiar construction in topology <coughs> as well. Or, or you know, if you want to be <laughs> technically careful, you could say it's a, the term is a vector bundle on any of these finite dimensional approximations uh, to, to VG. You know, to sort of say things carefully, you could say that. Um, uh, not the same B, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, right, so uh, yeah, and, and how do you do this? I mean, geometrically, I hope the picture is clear. You just look at V times EG mod G. That maps to, if you forget this factor, that maps to BG, and the fiber is this vector space V. But again, you have to realize this is not a product. This is not a trivial bundle. Um, it's, it's some vector bundle of the same rank as V. Um, but you know, what bundle it is depends on how G is acting on V. OK, so oh yeah, and, and so, uh, so you can take the term classes of that bundle. So a representation V of an algebraic group has term classes which are you know, elements in the Chow ring of BG. Um, so a reasonable notation is just to say C I of V in Chow upper I of BG. Um, so, so my point is just this, that uh, this is a convenient way to write down elements in the Chow ring of any classifying space. Just you know, any representation of, of, of this group gives you a bunch of elements in this Chow ring. They, you know, a priori, they could be 0 or whatever, but often these are interesting classes. And in particular, this class is such a churn class. Uh, so in particular, um, the Chow ring. I mean, maybe we define this as uh, the class of, of a hyperplane in projective space, or the first churn class of O of 1. But O of 1 is the, is the line bundle associated to the standard one-dimensional representation of GM. So you could say the Chow ring of BGM is the polynomial ring on the first churn class of uh, L, where, say, L is the basic, the obvious one-dimensional representation of GM. Um, you know, GM is isomorphic to uh, GL1. OK. Um, right. So yeah, so my point is that this class is not just something meaningless. It is the first turn class of our representation. OK. Uh, yeah, so I want to finish doing this calculation. Right. OK. So, um, so uh, let's see. Okay, so um, yeah, so so the, the problem was to compute these groups. Um, I've explained how we know these groups, and the point is these groups we also know easily. Um, th these things are just also the same as the Chow ring in the appropriate degree of BGM, because this is just. Um, homotopy invariance for, for a child group. So, so indeed, um, like the equivariant child groups of A2 are the child groups of you know, a certain vector bundle, total space of a vector bundle over um, BGM. But that is just the same thing as the child ring of BGM um, by homotopy invariance. Um, Oops, ah, sorry. Okay, so yeah, I hope you have this picture of it. We have this um, infinite projective space, a rank two bundle over it. We're removing the zero section. If we didn't, didn't remove the zero section, we would know exactly what this child ring is. And so the only issue is you have to figure out what this map is here. It can't be the it's a map from the child ring of BGM to itself, but it you know it can't be the identity map. It can't even be a ring homomorphism because it, uh, because of the shift in degree. But what it is by the discussion here is multiplication by the top churn class which is C2 of this rank 2 vector bundle on BGM. OK. Uh, so yeah, so let, let V be the two-dimensional. And OK, what is this rank 2 vector bundle? You know, it is the vector bundle associated to this two-dimensional representation uh, of our group. Um, so the, the two-dimensional representation of GM that we're given. OK, so how do you compute? The, the second churn class of that particular representation, well, you know, this representation is obviously the direct sum of two one-dimensional representations, sort of the, the one-dimensional representation of GM with weight one and the one with weight minus one. Um, so, you know, so, so the corresponding vector bundle is also the direct sum of two, um, uh, two line bundles and, you know, uh, taking the, um, 
taking this inverse corresponds to taking the, the dual of, of this uh, basic one-dimensional representation. And so, uh, yeah, so you have the basic one-dimensional representation plus its dual. Um, if I put other integers in there, like, you know, the representation t goes to t to the n for an integer n, this is the representation of the modal, one-dimensional representation of the multiplicative group, that would determine the line bundle like L tensor n. Um, yeah. But it's sort of, yeah, <laughs> there's no, uh, tensor minus one doesn't really make sense, but we interpret that as meaning the, the, the dual of a line bundle. <clears throat> okay, uh, right. So, okay, so the, you know, the general formula for the top churn class of the direct sum of two bundles is, is, is just the top churn class of the one bundle times the top churn class of the other bundle. This is a special case of the general formula, uh, which I think I even wrote down for, the, for all the churn classes of a direct sum. And so um, the top churn class of this bundle E is you know, C1 of, uh, well, in our setup, I could call it C1 of O of 1 uh, times C1 of O of minus 1 uh, in, in the Chow ring of, this is happening in Chow 2, I guess, of BGM or Chow 2 of infinite projective space. But you know, when you take the dual of a line bundle, the first churn class just changes signs. So this is like u times minus u or minus u squared. OK. All right. And so yeah, we can finish this calculation now. <coughs> oh yeah, OK. But <laughs> maybe I should, yeah. So the so, so basic point is like this is a sort of model example for how um, Equivariant child groups are useful. So, so here, you know, the action of GM on A2 minus zero is, is free uh, in a sense. At least the stabilizer groups are trivial. Um, but the idea is that it's easiest to compute that by relating it to other spaces like A2 where the group acts not freely. Um, because, you know, because, you know, homotopy invariance tells you something useful here. Um, so that's sort of typical that you, yeah, you want to study G actions, even if you're interested in free G actions, you want to relate them to other um, non free G actions. <laughs> right, and so the equivariant Chow ring, GM equivariant Chow ring for this action of GM on this space is the polynomial ring on one generator mod the ideal generator by minus u squared, which you could say is like z times 1 plus uh, z times u, where this is, this is uh, Chow 0, this is Chow 1, and everything else is uh, 0. Sorry. Okay, uh, right, and so maybe, I guess just. Uh, an amusing sidelight, which I mentioned in, in the problem, is that, um, right, so can you interpret this as telling you something about the child groups of the quotient? Well, the quotient is a little bit weird in this space. It's not a separated scheme. Um, so here, uh, so let's say, what is the quotient? Um, this sort of goes outside the setting where I define child groups, but anyway, um, you, can still, you can still give a reasonable answer. So uh, let's see, so what happens? If you take A2, and you try to divide by this action of GM that I sketched. Um, so T of XY equals TX comma T inverse Y. Uh, the, the usual game would be to try to construct a quotient by finding functions, polynomial functions on XY that are unchanged by this action. And there's an obvious one, which is X times Y. So there's a map uh, from uh, this space to the affine line by taking you know, XY to, to X times Y. That is a function sort of on the quotient space uh, because, yeah, because x times y doesn't change when you do this uh, operation to it. Um, so yeah, you might be tempted to say that this quotient is a1 or maybe a2 minus the origin or something, um, but it's not. And, and the reason is that this subtlety that, um, yeah, that what, what's the fiber uh, over 0 for this map? It's a set of points xy such that x times y is equal to 0, which is um, the union of the x and y axes. So I mean, yeah, I'm looking at a2 minus 0. But anyway, so that means that the fiber over most points is a single orbit, I mean, as you can check. But the fiber over 0 is two different orbits, this one and that one. And so the natural way to describe this is that this is the line with two origins. Um, so it's like the affine line, um, except that it's, it's a union of two open subsets. People draw this picture, which is a bit meaningless. But anyway, uh, you know, so it, what this picture doesn't really clearly show is that the, the union of two open subsets, each of which is isomorphic to the affine line, uh, and they're identified together outside the origin. Um, right, and so it is actually possible to define child groups for non-separated schemes like this, and that is the answer you get. That, so somehow, <laughs> this uh, topologically, it, it kind of does look like a uh, two-sphere if you think about it over the complex numbers. Um,
right? Like, it's like you're gluing together two disks along their boundary, and sure enough, you know, that would have cohomology like this. Okay. All right. Right, except that you're gluing in a different way. That's right, yeah. As it turns out, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't want to state a general theorem, but in this case, that gives the same shell ring. Okay, so what else to do? Okay, so maybe, like, yes, a bit more calculations of chow rings of, for example, classifying spaces. Um, so, okay, so, example, I've computed the chow ring of BGM as a polymer ring on one generator. Maybe a next case is, what about uh, for a finite cyclic group? Another, like, basic calculation in group cohomology. Um, so let G equals C mod N, uh, let's say, as an algebraic group over the complex numbers. Just um, simplify some things. Okay. So uh, how to, yes, yeah, so let's say, the question is sort of, what is the showering of that? Um, okay. Okay, so I try to um, think of this geometric, well, I don't know, what can I do? Um, the definition involves you look at sort of, uh, I, I start out with some faithful representation of G. Um, Okay, and, and in this case, there's an obvious one-dimensional faithful representation um, because the complex numbers has the n th nth roots of unity in it, so let L be the obvious uh, one-dimensional faithful representation of this group. Um, so maybe, yeah, this group is called, uh, say, the, has a generator called G, its peak power is one, and the, say the representation takes G to, you know, an nth root of unity, like e to the two pi i over n. Uh, in C star. Okay, so that's a homomorphism from this group to C star. Uh, is it called? And I say, yeah, the G to the N equals one. Okay. Um, okay. So, right. Okay. And then what we're supposed to do is that, um, like, Chow I of this classifying space is the same thing as well. I could just take the direct sum of a lot of uh, copies of this faithful representation, and then G would act freely on that outside outside a small subset. So. In this case, if I take um, like the direct sum of m, a big number of copies of this one-dimensional representation, then actually g acts freely outside the origin, as you can check, right? Um, and then, so we're just talking about this as long as I take m to be uh, greater than i, I guess. Right. So that's that's the definition of the equivariant uh, Chow ring. You can you have a lot of choice here, but this is one way to define it. Um, right. Right, so just to write down the actions, we're saying that G, the generator of the cyclic group, x1, x1 through xn by uh, zeta x1, comma zeta xn, and that action is obviously free outside the origin. Okay. Uh, in fact, this is just a restriction of that action of the multiplicative group that we've, you know, been using sometimes uh, to the cyclic group inside there. Okay. All right. So how do you analyze that? Well, yeah. I guess the thing is, I do want to think about how this group is related to uh, sort of GM acting on there. So, so here I'm dividing out like affine space minus the origin by a cyclic group, but I could go further and divide out by the whole multiplicative group acting by scalars. Um, so the thing is that we have an obvious vibration um, from you know, affine uh, M space minus the origin modulo of the cyclic group to uh, affine space minus the origin modulo of GM, which you know, for the action we're talking about is just projective space. Um, okay, and what's, so of course, and here we know what the chow ring is, so what's the fiber? The fiber is, um, I guess, let's see, I guess the fiber is sort of C, the model, it's like A1 minus zero, but divided by G, if you think about it. It's, yeah, I guess I could have written it's, it's GM modulo G would be a way to write it. Um, okay, which is just um, isomorphic to A1 minus zero. Maybe this has to be, um, this requires some comment, uh, you know, so how do you in general compute, or how do you define the quotient of an affine variety by a finite group? Um, so in general, let's say for G a finite group and, and X an affine variety or steam, um, the quotient variety of X mod G is just defined to be the variety associated to the ring of regular functions on uh, X that are uh, invariant by G, that are fixed by G. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so let's just do that calculation in this case. So here, um, uh, I'll do this for the whole affine line instead of A1 minus zero. The affine line divided by um, this cyclic group of order n acting is, well, 
sorry, it's supposed to be spec of a certain ring. You take the polynomial ring in one generator, and I pick the parts that are invariant under this group G. Okay, but how does the group act uh, on this ring? Well, it acts on X by X, the generator of G takes X to zeta times X. So this is like, this, this ring here is, um, it's like K times uh, one X, X squared, et cetera. It's a, it's a vector space with that basis. Um, and G acts on this ring by preserving the basis. Um, so like, you know, one goes to one, x goes to zeta times x, x squared goes to zeta squared times x, and so on. So, um, yeah, so, so because the group is acting in preserving this, this ba vector space basis up to scalars, that means that the, that implies that the, uh, in, the invariant ring is just, the, it's the set, it's spanned by <laughs> those basis vectors that are fixed by this group action. Like, no multiple of x is going to work, no multiple of x squared is going to work, but when I get up to x to the n, uh, you know, that goes to zeta to the n times x to the n which is equal to x to the n, okay? So, yeah, so it's just immediate then that um, this ring of invariance is just the polynomial ring generated by x to the n, right? So, uh, right. And so this ring of invariance is itself um, a polynomial ring um, in one generator, it's spec of like k of y where y is equal to x to the n in that notation. And so this is also isomorphic to the affine line. OK, and uh, yeah, if I had removed the origin, you know, that just corresponds to removing the origin in the image. Uh, yeah, so a1 minus 0 mod the cyclic group of order n is just isomorphic to a1 minus 0. <coughs> OK, uh, right, so that means that to compute the eigenvariant Chow ring of a cyclic group, the Chow ring in the classifying space of a cyclic group, um, it just means computing the Chow ring of a certain a1 minus 0 bundle over uh, projective space. Um, now, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's a line bundle over projective space minus the 0 section. The only question is, which is that line bundle? Um, and yes, not to drag everything out, but OK, you just analyze it. Well, how could I say? You think about it somehow, and you realize that this line bundle is the line bundle corresponding to the, um, to the nth power of, uh, yeah, it's the line bundle O of n. OK, so, so explicitly, a, like in low degrees, the, the ith child group of this uh, cyclic group of order n is the ith child group of sort of uh, O of n minus the zero section. Um, yeah, I guess exactly that. Uh, this is over um, over p whatever the dimension was. Yeah. Right. So so over projective space, you have a, this, this uh, line bundle um, and. The Chow ring of, of the cyclic group is just, I mean, so, so this is familiar in topology too, right? <laughs> this is the fact that, you know, how do you, how do you describe um, the classifying space of a cyclic group? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's approximated by lens spaces. You take a cyclic group acting on higher, higher dimensional spheres, um, take the quotient by the cyclic group, and th those spaces you can view as circle bundles over complex projective space if you want to. Um, so what we have here is an A1 minus 0 bundle over projective space up to homotopy, that's a circle bundle over projective space. OK, and finally, so OK, so what is this Chow ring? Well, so let's say in all degrees, the Chow ring of the cyclic group is, um, well, so this is a total space of a line bundle minus a zero section. As we've seen, that's the Chow ring of the base space, um, which is like Z of U, Chow ring of P infinity, module the first term class of this line bundle, um, or the ideal generated by that. So in other words, this is Z of U module um, N times U, right? Um, the first term class of a, this is the tensor product of n copies of the line bundle O of 1. The first term class of that is n times the first term class of O of 1. So in other words, this is z plus z mod n in degree 0, 1, z mod n, like this is times u, this is times u squared, and so on. It just sort of repeats uh, copies of z mod n after that. OK, and this should be familiar because that's exactly the same thing as the, the, the uh, Integral cohomology of a cyclic group. Let's see. So, so we see that um, taking k to be the complex numbers, um, the Chow ring of a cyclic group um, just maps isomorphically to the ordinary cohomology of the cyclic group. So in this 
ordinary cohomology, there's no odd degree cohomology. Um, yeah, so, so it's just there's, there's H0, there's H2, which is this, there's H4, which is this, and so on. And, and the generator of H2 is the same as the generator, I mean, or you could say the, the first turn class here maps to the first turn class in cohomology, and that's, that's the generator. <coughs> okay, so uh, yes, uh, sorry, how am I doing on time? Okay, okay, um, right. So, mm, okay, so now let's see. So, so this is sort of what happens in simple examples. Like for, for GLN, I also mentioned that the Chow ring just is the same as the cohomology of the classifying space, um, but that's not always true. Um, and so, I, yeah, at least I can give an example where that's not always true. So, uh, yeah, so example, okay, like one more case where things are always, are as in topology is that if I take the product of say n copies of the multiplicative group, um, I mean, the classifying state of product of groups is also <laughs> the cohomology, I mean, it corresponds to taking the product of classifying spaces, so I can think of it this way. Um, excuse me. So what is that? So this, this is basically like uh, the, the Chow ring of P infinity times P infinity, uh, you know, times itself uh, n times. Um, or in terms of finite dimensional approximations, we're just talking about the Chow ring of, of one projective space times another projective space. And that's easy to compute because we have this, uh, so in general, there's not a nice formula for the Chow rings of a product. There's a, a problem, a question on the problem sheet about that. But you know, in the case of projective space, it is true that the Chow ring of you know, Pn times any space is the Chow ring of Pn uh, tensored with um, the Chow ring of x. I just, let's say this is a fact. And this is you know, a special case of the projective bundle formula, which is about the more general case where you have a projective bundle, uh, which could be non-trivial over some space. Um, Right, so, so when you take the chowering of a product of uh, several copies of projective space, you just get the tensor product of the rings. So, uh, so, so this is just equal to the polynomial ring in uh, like n generators, where I could give these generators names, right? Ui is the first turn class of, well, uh, a certain one-dimensional representation of this group, right? Um, a one-dimensional representation of gm to the n, which, if you want to be careful and write it out, that's the representation where you take like n non-zero numbers and just project them to the ith uh, number, I guess. Yeah. Okay. okay. So in other words, uh, this is another. This group is another one where the whole Chow ring is generated by churn classes of representations, and in that case, it's the same as you know the integral cohomology. It has that. It is the same ring. <laughs> okay, but on the other hand. Once you get to slightly more complicated groups, it's well known that the cohomology of, of say, a finite group is, is typically not generated by churn classes of representations. And so you might think, well, what about the Chow ring in those cases? It turns out that the Chow ring, um, it has, seems to much prefer to be generated by churn classes of representations. That's not always true, but it, it really likes to do that. So uh, for example, um, let's say, if I take, say, the cohomology of Maybe let's I'll take a cyclic group of prime order, and let me take mod p coefficients. That p means the field of order p or z mod p, if you like. Um, so this is let, let's say p is odd, prime number. Um, then this is sort of slightly more complicated than the Chow ring. This is um, it's a free graded commutative algebra. Oops, I get this. Yeah, um, the free graded commutative algebra on some generators like x1 through xn and y1 through yn where um, these xi's are in degree one and yi's are in degree two. Um, so, so this notation means the free graded commutative algebra, which in particular means that these xi's um, have square equal to zero, um, because that's true for any odd degree element in, in cohomology. Uh, yeah, okay. Whereas, whereas these y's are the sort of polynomial, uh, they, they are polynomial generators. Um, right, okay, so that's that. So um, yeah, so in this case, um, so you might ask, okay, so what is uh, the cohomology of, say, the product of a bunch of cyclic groups, let's just say, by the Kunitz formula, um, because I'm taking field coefficients to be convenient, uh, the cohomology of this classifying space, well, that is, the, this classifying space for the product group is just the product of the classifying spaces, so the Kunitz, oh, I sort of, yeah, I think n was, yeah, okay, that's it, uh, right, so if I did this calculation for, um, for n equals one, <laughs> which would just have these generators x1 and y1, that would imply that the cohomology of uh, the product of n cyclic groups uh, is, is what I said. 
Uh, okay, so then I want to compare that with the chow ring. Um, so compare um, chow ring of this elementary abelian group. Um, mm, so question mark. Um, right, so yeah, so what is this uh, classifying space geometrically? So uh, yeah, without, yeah, let's just sort of crazy say this quickly. I mean, we have a, we're gonna have a vibration um, from uh, a big, <laughs> yeah, let's say. <laughs> Say. So basically, th this classifying space is the product of uh, n copies of the classifying space just for z mod p, which I described uh, geometrically. So that's that product. It's a bundle over like p infinity to the nth power. Uh, and the fibers, if I just had one factor, the fiber would be a1 minus 0. So here, the fibers are going to be the product of n copies of a1 minus 0. Yeah, I, could, I mean, I could just say this space is the product of n copies of the space that I wrote out before. OK, so what's the chow ring of this? Well, this is a situation where we know how to compute the chow ring, because what do we have here? We have um, this space whose chow ring we know. It's a polynomial ring on n generators. The chow ring is z of y1 through yn. That's sort of the right notation, because um, these y's are, uh, you know, they're co-dimension, complex co-dimension one cycles. So when I map them to cohomology, they live in degree two. And they, you know, in fact, these y's map to those y's. Um, right, but then what happens, well, here for, for this uh, total space of this bundle over that, well, I could think of going from there to there as first I take one a1 minus 0 bundle, and it, I know how to get the chow ring of that, and then take another a1 minus 0 bundle over that, and so each of these steps I know how to do. At each step, what do I do? I just, I'm just killing one element in the, uh, in the chow ring. So if you put that together, you get the following statement that um, the chow ring of, I'm uh, thinking, uh, thinking of this over the complex numbers, to be specific, the, the chow ring of um, the product of n copies of the cyclic group um, is, you take the polynomial ring in n generators in, uh, where these have degree 1, um, modulo, I'm, you know, taking these a1 minus 0 bundles is killing off uh, n elements, and those are uh, exactly, yeah, I guess, for cyclic group of order p, I'm killing off p times these generators. So I kill off the ideal p times y1 up to p times y. OK, and so the point is now that that's, that's not, uh, that's sort of quite different from this. So I guess if I introduced mod p coefficients, the way to introduce mod p coefficients in child groups is just take the integral of child groups and divide out by p. You don't have to, there's no Tor term. Um, so if I just take this ring, that child ring, modulo p, that's just the polynomial ring on F y1 through yn. And so you see that injects into the cohomology ring, but it's not the same thing. Um, as long as n is, well, yeah. yeah. I guess it's definitely not the same thing. Um, it's sort of the child ring only maps to these, these sort of even degree generators. Um, it misses the odd degree generators. Now, it's obvious, of course, that the chow ring couldn't hit these odd degree generators themselves because you know, chow i maps into h2i. But you know, a priori, maybe you might guess that the chow ring should be the even degree part of cohomology. But, but even that's not true. right? x1 times x2 is an element here that just doesn't come from uh, the chow ring. So in some sense, what it looks like is, yeah, I mean, in geometric terms, bg, we're sort of uh, revealing some extra structure on there. The, the space BG in, in topology comes from a, a, an algebraic variety or a limit of algebraic varieties, um, and not every class in its cohomology can be represented by an algebraic subvariety. In this case, sort of only the Y classes, not the, not the F classes, are algebraic cycles. Oh, yeah, and you might make that sort of makes sense why the Chow ring is in some sense closer to being generated by churn classes of representations, because for any representation, its churn classes live here, but they come from elements here. So, like, the, you know, the subring of the cohomology ring that, it, that is made out of churn clouds of representations, that always comes from the, the child ring. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's see. What else to say? So, there's some kind of, like, general... Oh, oh yes, maybe, let me, like, sort of one other way to think about what is going on here is that in this example... Let, let, actually, there's a general uh, question by uh, Yagita, which is, um, you know, is... Um, the algebraic cobordism ring of, um, uh, for, for an algebraic group over C, for example, 
um, a finite group, um, you know, is the algebraic cobordism the same thing as the topological group, uh, as the topological cobordism? Um, you know, that's very ambitious. It seems quite implausible, but as far as I know, that's, that's true in all the examples we know. And if this were true, this would imply that, um, uh, yeah, how do I want to say this? That I think, yeah, <laughs> this, this would imply in some sense that, um, you know, the, the fact that the Chow ring is not all the cohomology ring, that would be explained by the fact that not all of cohomology comes from uh, cobordism. So in, in this example of abelian groups, this conjecture is certainly true. And so, um, yeah, so the fact is that you could look at the, in, just in topology, the cobordism of this classifying space. And in cobordism, you have churn classes. So you have, you know, there are elements of cobordism that map to these classes, but there's nothing in cobordism that maps to these classes. So in some sense, it looks like maybe the difference between the Chow ring and cohomology is sort of explained by the difference between ordinary cohomology and cobordism, but we don't know. Okay, I stop there. Any questions? <laughs>